Good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to see so many friends and friends of permaculture here, and especially for this last session. It's been somewhat of an... This is, sorry, I've just started. Excuse me. You can't what? do your speech without this. Come on. <laughs> I thought... Oh. Sorry, everyone. Sorry, everyone, if you just hang on a minute. I'm not sure what this is about. This is two students of mine. I don't know if it's subversive or sabotage. Here you go. Oh, my. Oh. Oh. Stuff. How do you carry this around? <laughs> I was hiding it. You found it. I've been carrying it for years and years and years. Oh, yeah. You've got to give it oh. up. I don't know about that. I, um, a few years ago, went through a very profound despair now called the Great Grief when I realised that future generations, and many of you here today, and the babies we're hearing, may not inherit the world that I grew up in in Western Australia by the river and the bush and the garden. And the grief was really severe. It was a real mourning for life and systems. So I've carried that grief quite a lot, but I thought I was leaving it behind. What, what? See what you got in there? Yeah, what have you got? Mass migration. Oh my goodness. Reforestation. No, that's permaculture. <laughs> Wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> the bad news. Soil erosion. Oh no. It's awful. No Shocking. Not that. <laughs> Water pollution. Feel it with me. <laughs> Economic collapse. Oh. Oh. How about the deforestation? <laughs> Climate change. It's too hard and we're too few. We should give it up now and go to the pub and call it quits and forget about it. Wait, hey, wait, what's there's that? A, something else in this box here. Let's see what we got. Oh, what's heavy. this? Destruction. Yeah. Create small mosaic landscapes. Beautiful ones. Yeah. Uh, care for the next generation. Yeah. Treasure biodiversity. Oh my goodness, that was hard. I hope that I've managed to shift that. 
It's a shock to have your great grief brought in front of the public. Isn't it amazing how your students <laughs> surpass you? And there are many of them here who have done just that, and it's just with wonder that I look at so many here today and other students. So it's a great thing. Thank you both. That was terrific. Thank you, Rose. Love it. Okay. Yes. Well, goodness, that's been the theme of the concert conference in some ways, hasn't it? The good and the difficult, the really, really hard stuff to do. So, just to do a bit of a look at who we are and what we've done, we've been active for nearly 40 years. Very, very short time in life. And we've had some considerable achievements. And we've heard about a lot of those, haven't we? We've heard from Jonathan, we've heard about scaling up, we've heard about waves of permaculture from David. It's really been a rich smorgasbord in this um, conference. The thing that is on our side that even the Paris talks don't have is that major fact, we are on the side of life. Now that sounds simple. However, so many of the things that we started with Vala, people are not on the side of life. And I think because we're on the side of life, we're actually garnishing a much greater force than we have actually, we've been able to say. So I was looking at some of the elements and patterns in permaculture that have helped us achieve so well in such a time. 170 countries, perhaps a million graduates. I don't know, but it's a lot of people. How do I work that? Okay, thank you. Um, so what I want to talk about is that everyone is part of the solution and no one's part of the problem. So let's look at some of the elements and processes that got us here today that helped us achieve. Let's see if they're going to last us into the future, and if not, what do we need? So let's build on also our earlier speakers from yesterday and today. Now, what have we got in permaculture? What can you see up there? There's a need, there's a wanting. In some cases, there's a great grief but most people, or maybe it would be interesting to see if human happiness goes down with increased income and use of resources without caring for the earth. be a very interesting correlation if it existed. It may not, but perhaps the more we use up, the less happier we are. be good to look at people who live frugally and see if the happiness index goes up. We're going to look at our content, which has been entirely relevant for this new last wave of permaculture that David talked about from the 2002. And then we're going to look at our processes, what we do and why we're so radical. So is everyone happy with that or were you thinking get something else? <laughs> Have to ask. Is that all right? Okay, thanks. All right. So I'd just like to take you back to need and how fast some people pick up permaculture. This was um, in Vietnam at Doi Moi in about 1985. <laughs> Gosh, I crossed the centuries. I've grown old in permaculture. And so it's a buzz to see so many young ones. It's wonderful, so fabulous. So in 19, late 1980s, when I went, went to Vietnam, they'd had 30 years of war and 30 million bomb craters. And most of the houses looked like this, and most of the people were as thin as a toothpick. Really, really thin. And the people were hungry, but satisfied that they had achieved some sort of peace in their country. It was a matter of rebuilding and they knew they couldn't go back because they had 30 years of collectivisation, which, shh, don't tell anyone, they hated collectivisation. Like they liked the whole communist socialist government and Ho Chi Minh, but collectivisation, everyone moving out of their village where they lived for hundreds of years and their ancestors were buried, they loathed. They walked away from those brick houses, they left the doors floating in the wind and they went back to their villages. 
But two million men and women had died. The younger generation didn't know how to farm. They'd had 30 years of growing rice. 15 to 30 kilograms a month was the currency. They really needed to get started again. So there was a great need and they embraced permaculture. Next thing I want to look at is our content. Now, is that dark enough? Can you read it? Like Jeff, I love the permaculture content. There's something profoundly beautiful and satisfying about the way it grows in depth and in breadth over the years as you teach it. And I'm easily distractible and bored, and if it weren't like that, I'd be out. I didn't. I tried a year lecturing something in biology at university. I got bored. I shouldn't have, but I did. What I loved was the permaculture, and in the 30 years I've been teaching it, I have seen it, the evidence come in. You know, when people first started talking about changing the climate, lots of people said, that's ridiculous. You know, 98% nitrogen, so much oxygen, so much moisture, you can't change the climate. In my life, I've seen it change. So I've seen the evidence come in for a permaculture. First of all, the global problems, which were brilliantly done up to date. And I'm full of admiration, Varma, thank you. And then see how permaculture can work with that. And so I have put here just some of the outcomes rather than the course curriculum. I think you know the course curriculum, but the outcomes, you know, if we work well with land and care of the earth, we are go all our indices will be on accumulation of natural resources. We will look at how much water we've put back. We'll put at how much soil we've put back, how many species we've managed to save and build up. We will have measurements for the indices of restoration of ecosystems that become the most important thing in our economy. Because without that, no gelato society is going to exist. But we owe it to the future generations. We cannot go on like this. So restore and accumulate water, soil, forest. These must be our indices. Don't let us buy into the economists and the GDP and they won't believe us if we don't do this. They're going to have to believe us and we will have a better alternative, much better, and they'll say, tell us. So let's stay on for life. Let's be the people who love life, support it and want to see it grow. In terms of, ca of um, commerce, economy, we've been having a look at a whole range of things over these workshops, exciting possibilities, fabulous thinkers. Now, that's what permaculture's got, right? And then we've got the people, resilient and engaged. Now, when I started permaculture, the main objective was that everyone would build their own garden and... The first words that David and Bill used to talk about were permanence. And then gradually the word sustainability came in, but of course there's no sustainability unless you've got equal inputs and outputs, and we haven't got to equal inputs to match our outputs, so the word is, what would you call it, unbalanced or something? I don't know. You, you've got a better way of thinking about it. Okay, and then... We're now talking about resilience in case of perturbation. So we've had some changes. We've gone from the individual now to communities, to towns, to cities, to bioregions as our unit, to our watersheds as our unit of work. And in a way, we've dropped that hyper-individuality that was in permaculture in the beginning. And we've really come to a new position where we see ourselves as citizens of groups and members of communities. And I love it. I don't know about you, but it feels so good just to be part of a group. And I think we've had that here today. So when we look at the permaculture curriculum or knowledge that was passed on, it's got us all here today. And it has achieved superb things. Um, is the content going to serve us for a challenging future? Let's see. Ah. 
Oh, that's all right. You don't want to look at that anyway. Can you see? Can you see? It's basically a branching pattern. No. Well, it's got the managing director up top, and then you've got the executive, and then you've got all the staff people who um, sign things and do things and say you can and you cannot, and finally down the bottom you've got someone else. Which are the people? Us, really. <laughs> so, what we find in that model and that process is that everything new has to go back up to the top. The board will consider that when it meets in a month. The director's not quite happy about it. We don't like that idea. Where did you go to school? What's your qualification? We have been free of that because we've had a different pattern. So let's look at this. It should be three-dimensional. Thank you, Dana, who sent me that last night. Thank you very much. What we did, if you don't mind a bit of history, is we started permaculture with Bill and David. And it started to spread because people went out and taught. People like, like me. I, just went, I did a course with Robin Francis and I thought, oh, I'm going to have a go at this. And a year later, I was teaching. And I had eight people in my first class. Two were over 90. <laughs> and they would sort of fall off the chair and wake up. And then fall off the chair and wake up. One was a radical doctor. One spent a lot of time telling us, since as you grow up and give up singlets, you should also give up knickers. But they were an interesting first class. They came to permaculture. <laughs> the next classes had something like 18, 20 people and since then been teaching two PDCs a year, sometimes more in the Blue Mountains where I live. Now the point about the teachers is we have a long, long history. We teachers have gone to the marketplace, we've gone to the plazas, we've gone to the garages and the carports, we've gone to the villages and we've taught the way Socrates taught in the marketplace. We've taught the way Jesus taught in the marketplace, Confucius. We have a history of taking our conviction and passion out to where the people are and saying, hey, would you like this? We think it's worthwhile. And so, who set our first curriculum and said you are qualified or not? I'm actually not qualified, I think, to be here today because I haven't been properly diplomaed and certified, so <laughs> it's a bit of an embarrassment. However, I also appreciate the increasing demand for quality of teachers and asking what works. We must find out what the good teachers do and we will do that not by looking at their syllabus, not by giving them teacher training. Uh -uh. We have to look at their graduates. We have to say, how good are the people coming out of that class? Yeah. So, I would love, and I'm advocate, and I'm going to stand here and swear to you, I will defend any system that allows any person who wants to to go out and teach permaculture anywhere because it would be such a shame if we put the brakes on motivation and ability and passion. I will also defend the case that's in universities and TAFEs with a good curriculum to teach those others who appreciate formal education. But I stand with non-formal education of anyone who wants to get out there, do it. Make a film. Talk to your local society. It's yours. <laughs> so the success of permaculture, see those purple dots? You see the purple ones? Oh, no. Well, no. Sorry. We'll have the yellow ones. Can you see the yellow ones? Oh, I get things wrong sometimes. OK. So the yellow ones are the teachers. And the success of, teach of teachers in permaculture can never be underestimated. 
whether you made models and invited people to come and see or whether you just took groups of people and gave them certificates. Now those teachers taught teachers. See the yellow spreading? Who taught teachers? Who taught teachers? And exponentially, permaculture's moved across the world, really, because of teachers who taught teachers. Now, they didn't all do it with certificates and courses, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Now, what happened then is some people, gosh, I've got some notes here, I'm not sticking to them, um, were the designers and doers. And they did it. And without that, we teachers would have been lost. We had to go home and do it ourselves. But we couldn't say, hey, you guys, do this. We can't show you what it looks like. And I haven't actually done it myself, but, you know, my friends say we'd lose credibility. So we have to have those models on the ground. And we have to thank all those gardeners and people who went home and established permaculture, Masana, in their yards. OK. Um, and then we have the people who settled and they explored topics. So we had the people who started GEN, the Global Ecological Net Eco Village Network. We had the people who started Transition Towns and we heard from Rob this morning. And they made little nodes that floated off and have become independent. So what we've got is all these progeny of permaculture, and you could lay the food forest one. Today in America, there's a huge conference on resilient communities, but we're the ones, didn't it? We know about resilient. They've taken it and run with it. So various people grab it and run through permaculture and feed it out there. Then we find economics is becoming a new node. So these people then create their own teachers and their own networks. It's sort of what Bala was saying, we're feeding into everywhere. There seems to be no place in the world that we haven't moved into. If you have a look at those, the schools network, they all have their own conferences. Urban Regeneration has their conferences. You know, they're starting, it's, it's really creating progeny everywhere. Not much. I'm just getting started, really. <laughs> so um, I'm going to move on then. OK. The thing about our process is our pattern is our strength. If we had chosen a world body to control us, not support and resource us, and we haven't got one, we would be still back in Tasmania on the beach or in Dalesford, Victoria. It is because of our nodes and patterns and our freedom and our flexibility. And we must, over the future, stay open and adaptable to new ideas and areas. Um, and you can see that networks accelerate, as our governments know. That's why they don't like networks much. People's movements, the web, you know. I mean, we've got Perma Occupy in Washington and in Barcelona. Well, the node there, easy, the link was the web. And people just pick up. So we're going to tap into those. I want to look, talk to you about people doing new frontiers, except I'm not going to because I haven't got enough time. But have a look at Naomi Klein meeting up with Liz Bastian at a recent. Can you see what the conference is about? How do you feel about being part of that movement? Yeah. Right. Festival of Dangerous Ideas. And that's what we've been doing here in many of the workshops. Let's just go quickly to Cambodia where I want to talk for a couple of minutes about infiltration. So, um, you know, a quarter of the population slaughtered by Pol Pot forces, disempowered, thin, hungry, overworked, when I went to Cambodia, it was a disaster. Newly formed government had departments like rural affairs, agriculture, women's affairs, who didn't know what to do. They'd never held those jobs. They had no brief. Their department didn't know. Their government didn't know. It was hopeless. And so when they invited me to do permaculture in Persat, 
suddenly they had a brief and we had infiltrated into a government department. So that then spread from Persat province to Kompong Chenang to Svadieng to Kandal to Kompot. So I trained the first trainers and I trained them in permaculture. And then I went back and I monitored, I walked from village to village, monitoring, looking at food increase, the increase in, um, decrease in waste, increase in money. Often just a dollar a week was enough to send a child to school and a dollar a month would get you enough rice. Tiny increases in people's prosperity, but they could do it themselves. It became a people's movement. So the Department of Women Affairs went out to every village and they stood there in the dirt and under houses and they taught people how to do permaculture, but not until they'd done it themselves. So then the people learning had to come and look at the gardens of the trainers and the whole thing was embedded into in-service training and salaries. Not a new NGO, not a model farm, just right through. Same thing happened in Uganda with the Department of Agriculture at Rakai. Same thing happened with the CONSO in southwest Ethiopia. It's happened through, to some extent, Permatil in East Timor. It's happened with Castum Gardens in Honiara and the Solomons. So what we do have is putting things in place that are already existing and infiltrate and give people that knowledge which is my second passion, is the right to good, reliable knowledge and evidence. People in the Solomon Islands really couldn't assess whether the ocean was rising or not or whether they would get another tsunami. Terrible. So what we have done is try to get them information about their situation the way we've had here, but also information on how to move forward. So that information has enabled. I would like us now to just stop for a moment and think of those thousands, tens of thousands of permaculturalists in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Africa, in India, who can't be here today because they are the farmers on the ground practicing permaculture. If I could, I'd give every single one of them a certificate. Uh, they're absolutely worthy and they are our silent majority of permaculturists. We are the tiny minority. Right? Let's go. Mine. Just a picture. An orphanage in Cambodia, 300 children and three adults. Three tiers deep bunk beds corrugated iron roof bars on the windows. This is the play area. Permaculture there was taken partly by Jan Smart in Washington and she invited me to go. Within five years, those children have an egg three times a week. They get bananas, they get papaya, they have full vegetables and they love gardening. And when I arrived, they hated it. They had them all lined up chipping with a big hoe, a heavy hoe, chipping the weeds. It has transformed. At the same time, the local Department of Agriculture said, we didn't know when our Director General said you must do sustainability. We didn't know what sustainability was, but now we know. Right. So I'm going to finish in just a second. This is something close to my heart. This is Constantina Limberis in Greece. Tina spent... 12 to 18 months translating that book into Greek because she wants the Greek people to have the knowledge and the materials in their own language. She doesn't want them being told this is true or that's true. So she's launched that book, I think it's printed this week, and it's a fabulous thing and she's doing a PDC course for as many Greeks as she can get in the Peloponnese starting just after the end of the convergence. And if you can support her to invite Greeks, please do, because the people are terrific. And, well, we won't talk about governments, because that's sad, well, but the people are fantastic. Right. So that's Tina, who's just rushing ahead and doing it. 
No permission, just doing it. Uh, Burmese refugees, just doing it. Right. Let's look at... A Lati in the Conso did the course in PDC and the following Monday he was making seedlings and bringing 18 women every money Monday down to his village to learn how to do permaculture. Unpaid, unsung, unrecognised, but he loves it because fundamentally we're happy, aren't we? <laughs> so we are, all of us here, we all do so much more than we ever get paid for. We all belong to that gift economy which is sheer surplus. We all, I think, are happier than having those huge amounts of, you know, what was it, the G GDP going up and up. I think we're on the happiness scale because what we do matters and it's meaningful to us. Oh, I'm hurrying because Andy's looking at me. Um, <laughs> this book, I was concerned, I've always been concerned for resources, so I wrote the first book so people would have it at a level because I... I found I've got a small sort of brain and I had trouble reading Bill's book and keeping it together so I wrote an easy one for me and then it got published. <laughs> and then the second one about teaching is for teachers who want good material and it's thoroughly resourced. And this is for teaching permaculture teachers. And I wanted to do it because I wanted us to teach with a sense of care of people, not as curriculum but as process. So if we teach as if people matter as a process, we actually don't need a curriculum. Treat people well. Listen to them. Listen to their opinions, hear what they've got to say. So that is free online to any of you here, I think, because I haven't looked. But it was crowdfunders who gave that. And it was crowdfunders who sent Paula Parnanen with John Battalabasi right now to Solomon Islands to help the people get ready because they'll have to move. It was a crowdfunding which is part of a gift economy. Okay. Right. Where to next? These are the places I think you are needed and I think you're vitally needed. If our cities have five billion people by 2050, how good are we to offer cities fabulous resources? I don't think we're there. But permaculture shows we can be there and very quickly. We have more than 30 years to skill up and get good at cities. We've got lots of strategies. We've got lots of techniques. We can look to Hong Kong with their brilliant small-scale work. We can look to the roof gardens and the balcony, balcony farmers. We've got lots. We just need to put it together. Refugees, where, ah, oh, look, I'd be stoked if we could develop a lovely way to work with people who are going into camps. I've worked in refugee camps in the past and they see the need for permaculture and yet they're resourceful, they've got lives, they've got grateful to be there. They are some of the most wonderful people you'll ever meet. A friend of mine was in deep depression, terrible depression, till he started to work with refugees and he said, this is great. Not because he was helping, but because of what they give to us. It's a great generosity of refugees. So Karen, who's in the last course, lives in Spain, and she said, oh, I want to go to developing countries and I want to do what you do. I said, well, the developing countries are coming here <laughs> and so are the developed countries. And she said, well, I could go down to the coast, not far from our ecosystem, and see if people want to come up here and look and talk to us and share their skills. But go for it, Karen. You know, go for it. No qualification, no world body, no one's going to send you there. Right, so how will we do it? I think you can answer these questions. Accelerate the succession. We've got one example from India. We had a fabulous example this morning for the UGEN, how to use mass media and mass movements and get it right. We have to move into the future with more visuals. That puts me out. We have to establish quality of trainees. 
we have to enable. Enable, adapt. Right, I've finished with this. In Kabul, where the war has gone now since 1978, there's a group of young people called the Afghan Peace Volunteers. And they're 50 people, mainly orphans and internal refugees, living in a little house. And they got in touch with me and said, we want to learn permaculture. Now, they had no land and they had nothing to teach them and no books. And Kabul is being bombed. And so this is the rooftop of a girls' hostel and we've been meeting when we can because there's no reliable web access on Skype and a couple of them have actually died in the time since we started through landmines, bombs. They live probably in fear like people in Syria and they said, we'll do a garden. And it's a beautiful permaculture garden. They said, enough war, our journey to peace. We want permaculture. They're seeking support. So 50 young Afghanis, partly permaculturalists, are saying they're going to stop war in the world. I Takes them getting your head round. They haven't got anything, no families, no resources. They just believe it, it's enough. So, if they can, you can. Thank you.